One of our biggest findings with Ryzen 2 was its reduced voltage requirement at a given clock, discussed in our 2700X review. Our R7-1700 required at least 1.4 volts to 1.425 to maintain 4 GHz stability in our most torturous workloads, but our 2700X only required 1.162 to hold the same frequency under today's torture. This drew our attention because we already knew that our 2700X could barely manage 4.2 GHz at 1.425 volts without modifying base clock, though it could do so with base clock changes more readily. In other words, there was a 5% increase in frequency from 4 to 4.2 GHz, but a 22.6% increase in reported voltage requirement. Today we're talking about the volt frequency curve for the new Ryzen 2 processors. Before that, this is brought to you by the MSI GTX 1080 Gaming X and NVIDIA's GeForce Experience, which allows you to retroactively capture key gameplay moments with shadow play, convert captures into GIFs with new tools, and apply filters to games, hashtag no filter. MSI's Gaming X PCBs are high quality with well-built power management and coolers that we've previously recommended. Learn more at the links in the description below. Frequency with Ryzen 2 is beginning to act a lot like GPU Boost 3.0 or other modern GPU boosting features where basically your frequency is almost more dictated or predicated on the temperature and the voltage and the power than anything else. It's not like it's just a fixed number anymore. The boosting frequency headroom is entirely dependent on other factors. So provided you have thermal headroom, provided you have power budget, and provided your voltage is low enough that you have both of those things because the voltage will impact the power consumption and the thermals, you can boost higher. Automatically you can boost higher or even just manually overclocking, you can get it higher with a lower temperature to some degree. So we've tested a lot of this and our initial experience with Ryzen 2 led us to believe that the volt frequency curve would be almost exponential to the point where we can put one on the screen as purely an example where as you kind of approach the end of the stable frequencies, the voltage required to hold those stable frequencies shoots up like a rocket. So this is our hypothesis, basically that it's a somewhat exponential curve to maintain stability as clock continues to push upwards. And to be very clear here, we have been able to overclock higher or uh, more stably at least by using reference clock overclocking. What we're doing today though is strictly tuning the multiplier and vCore, and we're leaving everything else controlled. So we only want two variables for this one right now. Our biggest limiter here will be thermal. Ryzen 2 does actually run a bit warm, especially as you begin overclocking it. We typically do these tests with an NZXT Kraken X62, 280 millimeter cooler, max out fans and pump. As we progress through testing, we realized that we're running into a thermal barrier as the voltage pushed up to 1.4 and beyond and frequency to 4.2 and beyond. And so we eventually switched over to the Flow 360 radiator from Thermaltake with three maglev fans on it, which gave us enough headroom to push through the rest of our testing. So uh, typically, again, we run out of thermal headroom before we run into a, an unsafe voltage, as you might call it. So our concern is less about killing the CPU with too much voltage because we know we're not going to get there without basically exotic cooling or subambient cooling or something like that. So again, the hypothesis here is that at increasing frequencies, the required voltage for both chips, the 1700 and 2700X, rapidly increases out of a maintainable range thermally, and the vertical difference between the lines in our theoretical graph at a given frequency should become huge. 1.425 volts versus 1.162, for example, at 4 gigahertz. However, at a given voltage, the horizontal difference remains minor, 4 gigahertz versus 4.2 gigahertz at 1.43-ish volts or 1.40. And based on this knowledge, this curve again is what we expected to see, but it's just an example. Let's look at some real data. We'll begin with just the results table for the R7-1700. At the low end, we were able to maintain a minimum stable voltage of 1.069 volts for 3.5 gigahertz all core, producing a T-dye of 49 degrees Celsius at seven amps at the EPS 12 volt rails, equating 86 watts of power draw. Increasing by 100 megahertz to 3.6 gigahertz required an additional 0.0375 volts and increased temperature by a few degrees with power draw increased by seven watts. The next 100 megahertz jump required 0.044 volts with another 100 megahertz on top of that going to 3.8 gigahertz now requiring 0.06 volts it's becoming clear how this is a non-linear voltage requirement. 3.9 gigahertz required an additional 0.075 volts on top of the 1.212 volts we had previously, 
putting us at 1.287 volts. We're also now at 64.6 degrees Celsius and 144 watts of power consumption. Our final step to 4.0 gigahertz required 0.119 volts on top of the previous jump, putting us at a total of 0.337 over the initial 3.5 gigahertz requirement of 1.069. Moving on to a chart to help visualize this, we now add the 2700X data points. At 3.5 gigahertz, the 2700X needed just 0.9 volts to hold stable, a significant reduction from the R7-1700. The 2700X required an increase in voltage to 0.956 to sustain 3.6 gigahertz, or a jump of 0.05 volts and so on, until we eventually hit 4.0 gigahertz at 1.162 volts for this particular test run. That then required a jump of 0.08 volts to climb to 4.1 gigahertz, and at this point we switched to a larger cooler as we were hitting 70 degrees and up on T-Dye, which was causing instability, crashes, and limitations in our overclocking for our long-term blender burn-in test. This means that the X62 and Flow360 data is not perfectly comparable, and so is represented by a dotted line for the 360. You can see that the curve gets incredibly steep at 4.2 gigahertz, where we had to increase from 1.24 to 1.38 volts to hold stability with the larger cooler. Note that we could achieve this with lower voltage of tuning BCLK instead, but that's one of our controls here. We can't get into territory of really vertical increases because we're limited by temperature. Der Bauer included a graph in his 6000 MHz 2700X OC video showing voltages and frequencies he achieved without LN2. Reformatted to match our own graphs, his data looks like this. His voltages are lower because, among other reasons, he's using a higher level of LLC, but the shape of the curve is close to our own, right down to the sharp increase required at the end of the chart. He went as high as 1.5 volts without surpassing 4.3 gigahertz. He was testing in increments of 0.025 volts and 0.025 gigahertz, so we can extrapolate a best case scenario of achieving 4.325 gigahertz at 1.525 volts on the cooling solution he used with the controls he used. You can see our own voltage curve extrapolation is similar to his, with both hitting a steep wall at the end that is basically impassable without subambient cooling. Again, all core overclocking on the 2700X is sort of unrewarding. Same thing for the 2600X, because that X demarcation at the end means that your base and boost out of the box are pushed up just high enough that you don't gain a ton from overclocking all core, unless you go through and manually tune individual cores, in which case you're doing a lot more work to bin your cores, and you will get a bit more performance, but is it really worth it? It just depends on if you're doing it because you enjoy that process or if you're doing it for performance. Because if it's the latter, it's a lot of work for the performance. If it's the former, have fun. Because that's the point anyway, so it doesn't really matter what else it gets you. But the, the bigger point here is that, as stated previously, Ryzen 2 is able to sustain same clocks with Ryzen 1 at a much lower voltage. But as you push the frequency higher, it's sort of exponential, or at least a non-linear increase, in that you can go from 0 0.03, 0 0.02, increase in voltage to eventually 0.3 increase in voltage and up, which is a big difference. So uh, pretty interesting data from that standpoint. A couple of notes on test methodology before closing out here. I move this to the end just because people get bored of things like being accurate. So uh, for methodology, our previous test used both Prime and Blender, but in the interest of efficiency in these tests, we tested stability by using our most stressful Blender benchmark for about 10 minutes. That's enough time to perform this test, it's not enough time to guarantee a stable OC for long uptimes like 24 hours, whatever. But strictly for academic purposes, it's enough. And we're not going to 24 hour stress test, things like this, because it just, it would not be doable. So uh, plenty for the, the circumstances we're looking at for the testing we're doing. Der Bauer, his chart, the numbers we use there are with Cinebench R15. So we have different approaches, which means probably our test would be more likely to fail at a given voltage than his, just because Cinebench is a bit lighter on the CPU than our Blender benchmark, which lasts much longer. So uh, good enough for the purpose of this. In terms of other methodology information, uh, we used LLC one step down from the max level, which is why in the tables, especially in the article below, you'll see the input voltage is different from the measured voltage at the CPU, but that's fine, we present both numbers. BIOS settings and hardware were kept the same. Everything kept the same other than the CPU. 
vCore and all core multiplier, which were the variables being tested. And the 4.1 gigahertz tests on the 2700X were done using, again, the Thermal Take 360 Flow for 4.1 and up. And uh, that's as opposed to the 280 millimeter Crack and X62. And these are marked with an asterisk in the tables and a dotted line of the charts. So this wasn't a test of how high the 2700X can be overclocked. We can do higher than 4.2, barely. But uh, we were trying to see what could happen without adjusting things like reference clock, because it's, it's a test of volt frequency curve, not a test of max OC performance. And all core overclocking anyway is, is nearing, bordering on pointless these days with how good XFR2 is on its own. So something to keep in mind for the X-Class CPUs, or just buy a non-X one and overclock it to an X and get the same performance for cheaper. Anyway, though, that's the volt frequency curve. If you like this type of content, as always, go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats on back order. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.